Hey everybody, welcome to uh, our next COVID-19 webinar. Um, I'm Hillary Wicks, I'm the Marketing and Communications Coordinator. Um, as you can see, I've got Aaron Bannon and Kurt Rausch on the line with us today. Um, I'm just the logistics piece, so I'm gonna go over a few, few pieces first before we actually get into the webinar. Um, I wanted to make sure everybody knows where the questions bar is. Um, if you want to go ahead and locate that, you can give me a quick hello, uh, but do write in your questions. You can write them in as you go. Uh, we're going to be taking questions at the end of um, Kurt's talk, so I'll be reading those. Another option, uh, some people prefer to say their questions, so you can raise your hand, um, which is just a little hand figure, um, and I will try to kind of mix those in as we go as well once we get to the questions portion and then um, you will just have to unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Um, if you have any issues with um, hearing or any internet issues, I do recommend to try calling in on the link that GoToWebinar sent. Uh, there should also be a phone number with an access code. So um, that seems to work better for some people when we're having some of those internet overload issues. Um, and do just make sure that you write in any questions here in the GoToWebinar system, not in the email. Uh, and finally, just to let you know if you haven't seen, there's also a webinar tomorrow at 1 p.m. on business continuity planning, um, some of those financial pieces related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I'm going to get off here. I'll let um, Aaron take over and I will be back when we have questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hillary. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, again for joining us. Uh, very pleased to have uh, Kurt Rausch with us today. Uh, he's been a, a longtime partner to our industry uh, and has uh, had a relationship with America Outdoors and our conference and all of you for a long time. So uh, we're really glad that he can make some time in his busy schedule to be with us today. Uh, as I understand, uh, Kurt's got a hard stop uh, at about uh, 10 till the next hour. So um, we're going to uh, make the best of that time with all of you. So uh, yeah, please do uh, move your questions forward. We'll make sure we address as much as we can and give you some, some time uh, as well. And I think that uh, Kurt will have uh, some questions for all of you too, and uh, we'll appreciate the insight of uh, how various uh, decisions are, are impacting outfitters from a variety uh, and commercial operators and everybody uh, from a variety of, of parks and regions. So um, yeah, without further ado, uh, he began as a clam farmer. Uh, he moved up to uh, have a career in hazardous hazardous waste disposal and eventually found found his way into uh, National Park Service working on the other side of that and uh, uh, now is the uh, chief of the National Park Service's commercial services program, uh, manages our concessions, manages our seaways. Uh, very glad that he could make some time for us and uh, Kurt, I appreciate all the work that you have been doing to uh, respond and be responsive and think about, uh, let's say, your constituents as you work through all of this. So uh, um, uh, please uh, take the floor and, uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, what you have to share with us. Oh, thanks, Sarah. It's great to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, you know, it's really a challenging time for all of us and uh, including me, uh, I'm not used to being uh, stuck in my upstairs bedroom office, but uh, that's where many of us are now finding ourselves, particularly you all who like to be out and providing services to people in the parks. As Aaron mentioned, I am the chief of commercial services. So my office is located in Washington, DC, uh, and I live in Virginia. So we're currently on a telework status for an indefinite period and uh, Governor Northrop, our governor, uh, just put a uh, shelter in place order for everybody in Virginia through June 4th. So this is my world for the next uh, two months, it sounds like, other than maybe getting out for a run or something. So I know many of you guys are really struggling and trying to figure out what your business is going to look like for this coming summer. Um, I can speak a little bit. I thought I'd talk about uh, how the Park Service is kind of approaching COVID-19 and park closures and operational closures to the extent that I, that I have some familiarity with that. Um, talk a little bit about uh, 
uh, an interest in making sure that we've got a good program and plan for how you can reach out if you have any issues specifically related to COVID-19 and exposures of your staff if you're actually operating on park uh, either now or later in the season and maybe speak a little bit, but we don't really have a lot of information in terms of what we're trying to, what we're thinking of long term in terms of uh, your operations and what it might look like for the remainder of the summer and moving forward. And so much of this is so unknown for us. I think every day is a new day for all of us in terms of uh, closures and uh, operational changes and postures, both within the Park Service and probably the Forest Service and, and uh, state agencies that you guys are working for. So, you know, our, our, I'll start by saying that I think um, many of you have seen the information on the news in terms of the Park Service's posture. And I, I think um, the Secretary of Interior is, has been pretty clear in his interests. And that is that uh, national parks represent a, a, a fundamental, uh, important opportunity for people in terms of their, their mental well-being and their ability to get out and recreate. Um, but that's tempered by the need to make sure that we're doing that in a safe uh, manner that is protective not only of of our operators, such as yourselves, but also uh, our visitors and also Park Service employees. And so um, there's a lot of work being done to make sure that we're doing that in a way that makes sense. Some park, that may mean that for some parks, parks are closed and for other parks, parks are open, but facilities and operations are closed, which may include concession or CUA activities. And um, that is being managed on a uh, on a park by park basis. So for every park, uh, there is actually a, a risk management process that parks are using to analyze uh, what the current situation is in their environment. And they're looking at um, uh, using a number of different principles for that. First is uh, we're honoring, even in those circumstances where there may be church jurisdiction where the Park Service has what we call exclusive jurisdiction, we're managing to what the expectations of the local and state orders and requirements are. So if there's a telework order in a particular state or a shelter and home uh, position in a particular state, that's the one that we're adopting for those park environments as well. And that, of course, has a direct impact on our ability to provide services uh, in those parks. So. Um, for example, in the state of California, there's a shelter in place uh, policy for the entire state of California. And so that's being implied to uh, the park environment as well. And so what you're seeing out in parks for in terms of staffing is only those people that are, necess are absolutely necessary for park operations, so law enforcement and that sort of stuff. But most of the other operations are shut down in, in almost all the parks. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the parks are completely closed, but that the operations may be. So um, you'll see pictures of folks where people are hiking and moving around, and that's still that's still allowable where it can happen. But uh, we are also managing the expectations of things like social distancing and gathering size. And so it's really important in a lot of environments to, uh, while the park is still open and providing a recreational opportunity for visitors that, that we're managing to assure that we're meeting those expectations um, that the CDC has set. So I should point out that from our perspective, we look at state and local requirements and orders and, and guidance and the CDC guidance, and then we're applying what's the most stringent. Um, so if CDC guidance around, you know, we shouldn't have people in groups of more than 10 people or uh, our social distancing should be six feet or so, that's the standard that we would apply, be applying unless there's something more stringent uh, established by the state or local community. We're also very sensitive to the local community interests and, and listening to them in terms of their interest in, um, you know, whether parks should be open or closed. And uh, so the secretary is working very closely with the director of the park service and each super park superintendent to kind of manage that environment and make the decisions based on a risk analysis and an understanding about what the local interest is and that's why you're seeing something of a patchwork uh, many parks are closed many operations are closed but it's not the same everywhere um, really a couple of good examples around here are shenandoah national park and the national mall in Washington, D.C. So we're in the middle of Cherry Blossom Festival or Cherry Blossom time here on the National Mall where uh, the tidal basin is completely surrounded by Japanese cherry trees. And there's been a lot of challenges associated with managing group size and people in that environment, uh, managing restrooms, um, managing the, the amount, uh, 
the presence or lack thereof of toilet paper in all the restrooms because when you can't buy it at the store that means it's probably in the restrooms for the national park service and so everybody's gone in and uh, and borrowed some of our toilet paper and hand sanitizer uh, but the Parks have been working to try to figure out if they can manage that group size. And for a period, at least, um, I'm not sure what the current status is. They actually had, had to close the area because uh, individuals weren't really pr uh, actively participating in some of those social distance um, and gathering size expectations that we had. And so it was not really a safe environment. On the other hand, more recently, there's uh, at the same point in time, we closed down a local golf course that was part of that whole area because of those sorts of issues. That golf course has since been reopened because it's being able to be opened and be managed safely with all the social distancing requirements. And the golf operator is actually you know, using a lot of cleaning supplies to make sure that all the uh, rental equipment is clean and that sort of stuff. At Shenandoah National Park, um, they've closed down a number of the operations. In fact, I think they've closed all of the concession operations on uh, in Shenandoah National Park. They did have uh, one campground uh, cabin operation open and a camper store, uh, which was really important because it was supporting a lot of the AT through hikers that were coming through about this time of year is when they're passing through Shenandoah National Park. But uh, given circumstances associated with crowding and other things, and also some concerns by the concessioner itself, they decided to close that operation down. So the facility, uh, many of the facilities are now closed, except some of the restrooms, um, but uh, the park is still open and people are hiking there and, and uh, hopefully providing, you know, doing all the social distancing that's expected. So that's kind of the posture of parks. We're basically going from a, a we're looking on a one by one basis, accounting for local and state uh, expectations, as well as CDC guidance, looking to see can we keep the parks open and provide these recreational activities for um, for visitors coming into parks. And in those cases where a service can be provided in that setting, we may be um, those services may be provided as well. So that's kind of park posture. I talked a little bit about um, closures in terms of uh, commercial activities in parks and how that's being managed. So I, um, in a lot of places, uh, many concessioners and CUA holders have actually decided not to operate uh, because they were concerned about um, their own staff and the ability to, to protect their own staff when providing the service or providing this, uh, provide, effectively providing the service to visitors, meeting public health standards or any other number of factors. It could even include the, the ability for people to travel to the park using airline service as an example and the limitations that might exist there. So we've had some concessioners that decided voluntarily to close down and they are notifying the park superintendent that their intention is not to operate for a period of time. It could be the season or for, uh, for a set period as we kind of move through this pandemic. Um, and uh, the parks are acknowledging that and uh, recognizing that um, um, they're not going to be uh, be able to execute their contract for some legitimate reasons. In other cases, the park superintendent using this process that I just described relative to uh, protection of human health uh, is making decisions and asking our concessioners to close their operations. Uh, um, in order to meet public health standards, whether it's the inability to provide gatherings, uh, to manage gathering size and uh, social distancing, um, the concerns about uh, the ability to provide support services for those uh, operations that might be occurring. And so we have seen a lot of situations where parks are asking our concessioners to close their operations. Um, and I, I know that in several cases, that's also translated to CUA holders and, and concessioners that are providing backcountry operations. So I know, um, I know, for example, that, you know, two kind of, kind of quintessential guide and outfitter types of activities would include uh, Denali National Park, where the, uh, the uh, climbing, guide, climbing activities for the summer have been suspended for the entire summer. And also Grand Canyon River rafters, where there was a decision not to run any of the, the trips down the river. And I, I don't know all the specifics. Again, these are being managed at the park level, but, uh, you know, understanding issues around social gathering, um, um, and, uh, group size and the potential to, 
be uh, able to manage a potential sickness if it were occur to occur in a park, all, as well as all the infrastructure and the ability to get in and out of the park based on transportation, that sort of stuff. I can see in both of those cases the reasons why there was a decision to not operate those, those operations this season, um, just out of a, um, you know, kind of using a risk management approach. And I would expect in both of those cases that there's active dialogue between the park and the concessions in regards to why we're making those decisions. What do you guys think about it? Are there any mitigations that be, could be taken to allow those sorts of operations to open? But in both of those cases, that was the ultimate decision, um, which uh, the park is documenting and hopefully you guys are supportive of, because I think our interests are in making smart decisions that are protective of everybody. Um, and not uh, making unilateral decisions to, to the extent that we don't have to. So I think that that's where we kind of see um, the parks kind of coming down in terms of managing concession and commercial activities in parks. And I know for many of them, it's not a full season closure. It may be a temporary closure while uh, kind of this runs its course. And we're going to see later in the season um, the potential to open up facilities. I think that, uh, again, the the secretary's interests are in providing these recreational services where they can be provided safely. And so there's going to be an interest in looking, you know, later into the summer, perhaps things are going to be delayed in opening, but if they can be open safely, consistent with all of the policies that I mentioned, consistent with the local community and their interest in making sure that we're supporting them, uh, we want to be able to provide those services. What that looks like, if you guys have a crystal ball and you could tell me, you know, feel free to to pop a message in and tell me what it is because we don't know. Um, we really are living this day to day. I'm part of a incident management team for the Washington office. And on a daily basis, uh, parks are making decisions. Uh, states are making decisions. Localities are making decisions to respond to this. And so it really is a very dynamic process for us. Uh, the park service is also working pretty diligently to try to develop in real time policy on things like uh, managing housing, both park service housing, bringing seasonal uh, folks on. How is that going to happen? How can we make it happen? Is it is it the right thing to do? And those sorts of things also translate over to our concession operations, uh, which may be both the backcountry operations where you're trying to make decisions on when something's going to open and whether you should start talking to your seasonal folks to bring them on, as well as the front country operations where there's conversations about shared housing and whether it makes sense to uh, you know, uh, how do we manage the shared housing impacts? Uh, we know that in many cases, universities have, you know, discontinued classes because of impacts for community spread in those environments. And so parks and the park service in cooperation with the department are working really hard to manage all of those expectations and do what is best for employees, for visitors, and, and also for our partners such as yourselves. Um, Everybody is doing that with an abundance of knowledge as to the impacts of it. So that none of this stuff is being done lightly. Um, so that's kind of where we are in closures. Um, I want to make sure that I'm really clear on uh, letting you know that we want to hear if you've got any issues, if you're working in a park, uh, even if you're coming in on a daily basis, uh, or if you've got employees in a park, even now or in, later in the season, we want to hear if you think you have any suspect cases or known cases of COVID-19. Uh, it's really important in a park environment where people operate very closely and there's a lot of community potential for community spread to know this information quickly. And almost all of you that operate in the backcountry are aware of the procedures that we have uh, relative to managing things like food safety. And uh, you're probably all very familiar with your U.S. Public Health Service officers that support us. Um, we are one of the few, uh, uh, we are the only uh, bureau within the parks, within the Department of Interior that has a unique relationship with the U.S. Public Health Service. It's actually, they're celebrating a hundred year anniversary of that relationship this year, oddly enough. Um, and uh, our, we have about 18 uh, official public health service officers. They've actually staffed up. I think we're up to 32 to 34 commissioned officers that are present in parks and are managing uh, the COVID-19 as well as all the other issues. And so if you have a situation where you think there's a suspect case or there is actually somebody that is tested positive, we want you to use the same procedures you would use if you were to 
it have a neurovirus potential or something like that, and that is immediately contact the U.S. Public Health Service officer and your park superintendent. Let them know the issue because um, it's really important for them to be able to support you in understanding what the issues are. Um, most community public health uh, organizations are already pretty darn busy, and so we're rec we're kind of operating on the on the stance that the U.S. Public Health Service are going to be our community public health. And they're going to be working us through all the expectations in terms of managing those sorts of situations. So um, if somebody's suspect, we're working particularly in front country operations about how those individuals might be quarantined, uh, how testing might occur. And then ultimately, and we do have regrettably a number of cases already within the National Park Service of uh, exposures, even some within the concession community uh, where they're being isolated in the park and being managed. And, with an ultimate endpoint, if they get really ill, they'll be transported out in the, the way we would manage any emergency response activity. But the message here is don't be shy about making sure that you're reaching out if you have any concerns at all in regards to that. It's super important for us to know that because ultimately it's gonna help you manage your business and the potential for um, impacts to your employees and also us as, a, as the, the larger uh, park service community. So it's really important to do that. If you have any questions about that, um, the Public Health Service uh, has a listing and I wanna uh, direct you to our actual uh, nps.gov website. And if you go to nps.gov and, and click in in the search bar, uh, commercial services or commercial use authorizations or uh, concessions, you're gonna pop to one of our uh, entry pages and those entry pages have a direct link to to information for directly for our partners, such as yourselves, on COVID-19. And it provides access to the list of public health service officers and a summary of some of the information I've just been describing. So again, if you have any concerns about potential exposures, please let, let us know immediately. Um, so then the, the question is, well, what are we doing about uh, the impact to folks right now? Um, Thing, we are a bureaucracy, and so things don't always move quite as quickly as we'd like to. Uh, we do know that uh, many of our concessioners that are operating now have, uh, have monthly um, uh, franchise fee payments that are due, uh, kind of rent payments, if you will. We also have leases where, where there are rent payments that are due. And so we're working on, uh, and we wish we were, it was moving a little quicker, but we hope to be able to defer some of those payments out into, at minimum, out into the September timeframe. We also know that franchise fees in most cases are a percent of gross revenue. And so if you're not operating, 0% um, of zero is zero. So it's a bit of a lipstick on the pig kind of approach, uh, but we wanna at least get that out there. I also wanna point out that nobody's, uh, uh, that annual financial reports for everybody are typically due by the 15th of April, and we're trying to get that moved out again. And uh, you can take you know, this message as an indication that 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 is what we're going to be doing. So if you're working furiously to try to get your AFR put together in this time of hardship, we would like you to kind of uh, don't worry about that. Uh, we've moved that date or we intend to move that date provided that it's approved by the secretary out to the 15th of July consistent with uh, what the IRS has done in terms of tax filings. Um, we don't really know what we're going to be doing in regards to um, future prospectuses, uh, bid packages that are out. Uh, or coming up, you know, this is really a, a moving target for everybody in terms of what the long range impacts are, uh, how quick uh, businesses are gonna be able to bounce back. We wanna make sure that we're doing whatever we do in, in a judicious and thoughtful manner. And um, so anything that is, you know, imminently ready to be put on the street for bid, we're probably gonna be waiting a little while on. Uh, and then the decision on a longer term solution as to whether we're gonna extend contracts or um, or issue them as is, is gonna be highly dependent upon and some really good analysis to make sure we're doing what's smartest for you as well as for uh, as well as for us. And so we'll, we'll be interested in getting feedback from you all on you know what your perspective on that sort of stuff is. In the same way we've been asking many of our other concessioners that are front country operators. Um, and we don't know what, um, what opportunities exist within the CARE Act that was just passed, as well as uh, what other sorts of things we might be looking at in the long term in terms of providing any relief. Our interest is in making sure that you all are able 
and ready to provide services whenever parks get back online and it's safe to do so. And so, you know, our interest is in making sure that we're, we understand what we might be able to do and not do, but doing that again in a way that kind of makes sense for everybody and is a benefit to everybody. So I don't have a lot of answers on those kind of longer range ideas and what that's going to look like. We continue to do a lot of uh, work to try to crystal ball what that's going to going to look like. Um, I think that's those are the things that I really wanted to cover, Aaron. So we talked a little bit about the closure activities and how we're managing those. And I'm happy to answer any questions that I can on that. Again, most of that is site specific, but using kind of an algorithm and a kind of a, a risk management approach to that. The uh, the need to make sure that we care about um, potential issues associated with people that might be exposed because it's really important to all of us. And then, you know, what we're doing in the immediate term in terms of providing you know, making sure you guys aren't worried about things like AFRs, but then also looking, you know, uh, taking a longer term perspective, but not really knowing what that looks like in that nobody really knows where we're going to be a week from now, two weeks from now, two months from now. So I think uh, unless you have any other specific questions, Aaron, um, I'm happy to answer any questions people might have. Great. Well, um, thank you so much for uh, walking through that. I know you. Uh, uh, have been uh, probably deep in the weeds on a lot of this and appreciate that you are uh, on the crisis management team at the National Park Service. As, as we were uh, uh, prepping for this yesterday in our conversation, it really uh, struck home with me uh, that you were uh, one of the true advocates for outfitters and guides, uh, the CUA programs, the, the folks who are uh, you know, uh, running trips that maybe don't have as big of a footprint as, uh, you know, a, a large concession, but nevertheless are heavily impacted for that. And we uh, we share a concern that uh, these providers of these activities who are in many cases the only interface that their clients are going to have um, are as well supported as they can be to make it through this. So I uh, appreciate your support and your effort to uh, find ways for parks to work successfully with their concessioners. And indeed, there's um, been, uh, I think, a variety of, of, as there's been a variety of approaches to whether parks can operate and whether parks can close, uh, I've sensed a variety of uh, responses to that. Um, and, uh, you know, some folks who have been compelled to close are certainly uh, looking for more opportunities to collaborate and others um, are finding those opportunities to collaborate are sympathetic to the decision and are just uh, looking at how they can be good partners to to work through this um, so I've been uh, uh, I think heartened by the heartened is a good word for that uh, by the, the compassion and concern among the outfitter community in spite of uh, how personally and you know professionally damaging uh, it is to consider not operating for such an extended period of time. So um, so thank you, and thank you for your advocacy on that. Um, and uh, I think we can uh, go to questions here in a second, but I sort of wanna uh, just ask a general question, um, which is, you know, as you look at options for relief for outfitters, um, you know, if that's, whether that's like a fee, fee deferral, as you've discussed, uh, or whether there might be some things operationally that uh, parks could consider uh, to help outfitters recover lost revenue somehow, uh, either through programming or uh, softening or regulations or whatever. Um, I'm curious, like how how uh, I guess how open the door is for you, and how you might also feel uh, somewhat constrained let's say, by uh, existing law and regulation? That's a great question. And I, I will mention, I forgot to tell you that uh, I'm directly impacted. I have a, a, a trip to Lake Clark planned in, uh, in June, and it's looking a little sketchy as to whether that's going to go off or not. And I also have a daughter who works for Hilton uh, in the headquarters office here, and she just was furloughed for three months. So uh, you know, it, it does hit home. Uh, but I, it's a really good question. We we are definitely constrained by law and regulation. So um, 
uh, to the extent that we can make decisions that are around the statute that we have, which is the mostly the 1998 uh, Concessions Management Improvement Act that talks to uh, the structure of contracts and when we can make decisions on uh, franchise fees or not make franchise fees. There's some criteria in there that, that are applied. We have to apply all of those things. So we are not, you know, we don't have an open-ended opportunity to do things. But that said, uh, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of operating season. Um, you know, for some of our front country operators, we have a few more tools in the quiver. Uh, things like uh, there's payments of a thing called leasehold surrender interest that we can that we can work around. There's the ability to defer large construction projects that will provide some capital infusion early on. We don't have as much of those sorts of things for guiding outfitters because there's not as much of that kind of rigor. Um, but operating season, reducing, um, you know, the number of trips, all of those sort of, in order to make sure that we're managing um, to the extent that we see visitation come back and we're right sizing that and, and also making sure that um, from a business perspective, you guys are um, able to operate, but also uh, perhaps cut away at some of the extra costs that might uh, be present. Otherwise, I think these are opportunities for us to, to talk about them and I entertain you know, and look forward to any ideas that you might have on what those sorts of things would look like. I, um, we've begin, begun to think through those, but we are very anxious to hear from our partners about what we might be able to do. And I'm happy and, and try to be fairly transparent about saying, you know, that's a non-starter. We can't do that because we're not allowed to statutorily or on the, under that would call require regulation change. We'll be clear about that. And then, you know, yes, maybe there is something we can do around that. And uh, here are some of the the bugs that might exist in that, how can you help us work through those? So i happy to hear those. I don't have any magic pills at this point in time, Aaron, as we've talked about in the last day. Um, but I'm, you know, you all know a lot more about your business than I do, that's for sure. And so you know, if you have thoughts on ways to do things, I would encourage you again to look at your contract and the regulation and try to think, well, what can we do within the context of these constraints? Uh, and then give us advice. Um, we would love to hear it. Like we won't always take it, but um, you know, knowing what you're thinking, you may have ideas that we could really help uh, use. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Well, uh, time is ticking by, so um, we should certainly give yeah. people a chance to uh, ask some, get some uh, targeted asks to you and us out there. That sounds great. All right. Yeah, I'm going to just start digging into some of these and um, trying to not ask things that you've already answered, but if I do, just let me know. Um, oh, that's okay. So in regards to deferral of a franchise fee or any alterations to concession fees, um, how do you imagine that playing out? Is that going to be across the board or will that require requests uh, on a kind of case by case basis? Great question. Don't have the answer yet. Um, the bottom line on it, you know, we have historic, so that the criteria around franchise fee release is that the uh, franchise fees can be um, changed in the case of something called an extraordinary and unanticipated situation. So the first question is statutorily, are we in that, are we there? Um, many would argue, I think you would all argue pretty clearly that a uh, worldwide pandemic is probably considered an extraordinary and unanticipated event. Um, uh, I suspect I, I, that's, a, that's a decision that ultimately will be made by the Park Service leadership, but you know, your advocacy around that and, and providing an explanation to that is certainly really important. How we would then go about providing any kind of relief if that were determined to be the case is a really interesting one. I think, um, it's hard to under hard to think through things like the fact that the entire season for Grand Canyon rafting is done, and yet, uh, and I'm I, I'm trying to think of uh, another rafting operation. I, I'll say, uh, and, and again, forgive me because I don't know that there is such a thing. But if somebody was rafting the No Attack up in Alaska, and that operation was to still happen this summer, um, and it's got a later season, so maybe it opens up, and maybe the amount of impact to that is is less you know, would we be applying the same standard? It's really hard to, hard for us to say. In the past, we've done one franchise fee, what we called holiday, 
And that was at the uh, end of the 2015 uh, government shutdown. And at that point in time, it was an across the board one month holiday for um, I think the month of October of that year. I think we were closed for September and they gave October as a holiday. I, at this point in time, not, not really sure how we would apply this and how to do it fairly so that every so that those that are uh, are impacted more or uh, substantially as opposed to those that may be able to operate pretty quickly the other interesting aspect of it is and we don't really know the answer to this is to what the bounce back is going to look like and is that going to be determined on a park by park basis so as an example we have a small marina operation near my house um, actually, it's only about a quarter mile away on the George Washington Memorial Parkway. Not a guide and outfitter operation, but they provide kayak rentals, kayak tours, and uh, sailboat rental op activities. Most of their clientele is local, uh, and it's predominantly kids from the area that go down and rent that. We're, we don't have international travelers coming down to do a little kayaking thing in Dyke Marsh uh, on the Potomac River. That operation is likely to bounce back pretty quickly if the if the uh, the uh, shelter in place orders are, are lifted. On the other hand, going back to that no attack example, uh, you know, if Alaska retains its uh, inability to have trans uh, interstate commerce or intercommunity commerce, and the the airlines are still really down, they're going to have a lot more impact in terms of their kayak rental operations, say it's on the no attack, than they are here. We don't know how we're going to manage that yet. Um, we want to be fair and. Uh, but we also need to be practical and actually have something that's executable. So I don't have an answer. We're thinking about that. I mean, that's really what I want everybody to know is that we're being thoughtful and considerate on this. We don't have the answers yet, though. Thanks. Great question. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and uh, well answered. Um, thanks for working through that. Uh, when you talked about a a holiday, did that mean? that for that month of October, whatever, like you accrued in revenues, you weren't expected to pay fees upon? That's correct. So um, in 2015, I think that was the year, um, the, the, we were closed for September, which was a pretty high, uh, you know, height of the season month, but October has pretty good revenue stream as well because it's uh, early shoulder season. And so what essentially happened is there weren't any revenues for September, um, what we wound up doing is saying that for October, uh, there were no franchisees payments due by anybody. And that was uh, represented as some sort of compensation for the loss for the previous month. Now, I will, I will say that um, the Park Service's position isn't always that, you know, we uh, essentially um, indemnify you for any risk by waiving any uh, expectations of revenue into the future. You know, you as businesses make decisions on the upside and downside of the economy. Um, and that's part of the reason why we contract with you to take that on. Um, so one should not be thinking, you know, we were out of business for, for six months and therefore, you know, you're going to make us whole for that six months. That's not necessarily the way it works. But what we would want to do is look at, you know, what was the impact and what's a reasonable expectation. Now that was a franchise fee holiday. That's quite different than looking and saying, we're going to renegotiate franchise fees to lower those fees for some extended period of time, whether it's the balance of the contract or a period of time. And again, we haven't really thought through what the most practical, considerate way to do that would be. Um, there is certainly a lot more complexity to say uh, renegotiating uh, we have approximately 500 concession contracts. We were negotiating a franchise fee for some period of time uh, as compared to saying one month or two months or whatever it is, we would just waive franchise fee payments altogether. And so a lot to think about there. And we're gonna be busy trying to figure all that out. Great, thank you. Yeah, one of the levers you can pull, indeed. Right. All right, we've and got a question. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, if some of these operational flexibility issues are park uh, specific, do you suggest going to the park concession folks or to you? You should go to the park, um, definitely. Uh, my decision-making capability and decisions on uh, closures and openings is, um, I don't have that authority. 
the park superintendents are making these decisions. My interests are in making sure that parks have the guidance and that they're applying the guidance consistently and appropriately. So uh, we want to make sure that a park superintendent at, at uh, Dinosaur and a park superintendent at, excuse me. Go ahead and take that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, and a park superintendent at um, at Big Bend are uh, looking at what the uh, uh, what the risk profile is and use in applying the state and local guidance, CDC guidance, and this risk assessment tool that we've prepared uh, consistently, starting from the point of you know we're going to try to keep operations open if it makes sense, and then kind of working through any of the mitigations. And I think it's really important to talk to your superintendents, particularly because. You as operators are the ones that know what you could do in terms of mitigations to make an operation safe and uh, and a really good experience for visitors. You also know the lo the uh, how uh, folks need to get to your park and what the local community is doing and all of those factors. I don't have any of that information, and that's the reason why park superintendents are being given the authority to make those decisions. That's why they get paid the big bucks. Um, I. All I can do is really make sure that there's consistent guidance out there. And if I see inconsistencies, point that out to the NPS leadership so that they can walk, come back to the superintendent and say, hey, did you really consider this? Um, again, I think that the, the perspective of, of the Park Service and the, the, the Secretary's office is, you know, we want, we want recreational opportunities to happen if they can. Um, and so that's the starting posture that Park should be working from. But yeah, definitely, Work with your superintendent first. Of course, uh, my phone and uh, email is always open. And so if you feel there's a need, you know, you can also push it to your regional director and then ultimately you can let me know about it. Even if it's just a uh, situational wariness, hey, you know, just letting you know we were, we were closed down. Uh, I am happy to take those kinds of conversations. Um, I won't necessarily act on them. I'll say, uh, you know, that's interesting and then take that information back to the MPS leadership or back to the park and just make sure that they are aware of the fact that you see some inconsistencies or some concerns. That, thank you for that answer, Kurt. It sort of um, uh, triggers two quick ones for me that I'll just ask together. Um, and one is, uh, is, is uh, as your guidance rolled out um, across the land, is there guidance, is there other specifics in the guidance to uh, like communicating with uh, local concessions and CUA holders um, that that can help folks who maybe haven't started those conversations uh, have an expectation. Um, and maybe we'll just start with that. So I think that uh, any good park manager and their staff, I, I hope, are actively communicating with all of their partners at this point in time. I think active communication is really, really important. If, uh, and that's information that we've been sharing, you know, make sure you're reaching out to people, that you give people a clear understanding so that they have situational awareness. I think as many of your operations start to come online, it's particularly important because you're making decisions now or a week ago or two weeks ago that are impacting whether you're gonna bring seasonal uh, guides on or not. And so you need to have that understanding from the parks. If you're not getting that, you know, I will take that message back and make sure that we're having meetings, regular meetings with our regional folks. We had a meeting with all concession specialists, try to articulate that, you know, you need to communicate with your folks. Uh, your partners need to know where you're going with this. So I will take that message back. I think um, they should be communicating, they should be communicating regularly. I will say, however, that this is a moving target for parks as well. So on a daily basis, parks are falling um, and closing or sections of parks are falling and closing. And sometimes that's because the state or the locality has made a, a proclamation. It could be because the state or the locality has decided that they're concerned about the visitors traveling through their communities and coming to the park. Uh, to recreate and that 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 could be potentially putting them at risk. And so there is a big moving target there too. So active communication and continued communication because ultimately the the uh, the situation now may be quite different from the situation in two weeks or the situation in a month. So I, I'll take that message back to our next all hands meeting and make sure that they're getting that 
you know, please reach out. It's certainly a challenge in a lot of parks where there's a large number of CUA holders and concession holders. So I would also strongly encourage you to go to the park website uh, and use the resources that are available. They're, they're being asked to maintain active information on their closure statuses and the information so that you have that information as well. Because, um, you know, I know there's, you know, I can't remember how many uh, horse operators in Yellowstone as an example and trying to, you know, make sure that we track all the horse operators down, some of whom may be, you know, not operating yet. And so maybe in a, a offsite location that's hard to reach is sometimes difficult. But we're, but I'll take that message back again. It's a good one. Yeah, thank you. Um, and as uh, as we're sort of communicating out the impacts of operators, uh, primarily to Congress so far, it's been uh, uh, it's been a little hard to get on the radar screen, just given the number of interests that uh, are trying to get some space there. So, um, you know, uh, as we look at like the last bill that went through and try to look at how that works well for operators who are struggling with the seasonality of it, and just, you know, trying to get those concerns made uh, aware of at the congressional level. And as you are working through this, I'm wondering if you feel that above you, like uh, at the you know, uh, David Vela's office at the at the Secretary of Interior's office. If uh, if we are appropriately on the radar screen, or if you think we need to be uh, telling our story at that level as well. I um, I'm confident that uh, both Dave Vela as the acting um, or the Deputy Director acting with the authority of the director, that's his full title these days, uh, as well as the secretary. I mean, I have actually, I was in a meeting with the Secretary of Interior, which is highly unusual for somebody at my level, um, and concession and CUA activities were on the table with his interest in, again, what I've articulated, try to maintain recreation and uh, maintain continuity of operations where we can. So I think that it's front and center conversations about what relief might be necessary are also present in in that space so i think they know that said you know we don't have the ability to uh reach out directly to congress to advocate and that's not something that as federal agencies we're allowed to do so any advocacy you want to do uh we would encourage you to do that i mean also you know i think recognizing the dynamic situation that exists within the department and the park service now and being you know, sensitive to the fact that we don't have answers at this point in time. Uh, it certainly doesn't hurt to reach out to the secretary or the assistant secretary, uh, Rob Wallace, or to uh, Dave Vela, and then just uh, let them know that, you know, you're part of the team and that you're interested in supporting the park service as we move through this and uh, to include, you know, continuing to provide recreation services where you can and making sure that that experience is still enjoyed by visitors. I don't think that hurts at all. Uh, I don't think it's the right time to make big asks. Um, so, uh, you know, I think to be frank, uh, doing that now is probably would not ingratiate anybody because there's there's recognition that it's impactful to businesses. We know that we know it really, really well. We don't have any answers, and so saying, "Hey, we need," you know, "this is what we need," we're, um, is probably going to ring on deaf ears or cause that piece of paper to be kind of pushed across the table and for later. So, you know, that would be my advice just kind of corporately on how to manage that. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. That's very helpful. Thank you. Spot on. Um, what do we got, Hillary? Yeah. Um, we're getting close on time, but I want to make sure I get this one in there. Um, I didn't quite ask it right, I think. Uh, is there potential for reduction in concession fee or extension of the concession term? So this gets back to my kind of earlier comment that we don't really know what we're going to be looking at right yet. Um, we want to be fair and, uh, and considerate in recognition of the business impacts that are occurring. Uh, as I mentioned before, the statutory authority, at least on the on concession contracts, is is it an extraordinary, unanticipated event? Um, we have the ability to extend contracts, and we and if that uh, threshold is met, we have the ability to look at franchise fees and do diff different things. And we've done that once before in the history of the Park Service that I'm aware of in terms of franchise fees. So those are things that are on the table and that we're talking about, but we're still 
you know, we wouldn't even know where to start and what kind of release package looks like. Uh, what is the, the impact to, uh, to the relief acts that, that have been uh, provided because that, those were federal authorities and use of federal funds. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're, we're uh, understanding what that looks like, where we, we want to understand what the financial impact really, if we, to the extent that we can, uh, is going to look like into the future so that we can make good uh, conscientious decisions on behalf of you, but also on the behalf of the Park Service and visitors. I, I think it's worth mentioning that you know, um, franchise fees within the National Park Service are really important to us as a, as a uh, organization. So uh, we had a meeting with another sister association where we had five superintendents that were in front of the room and they went down the line and uh, each of them spoke to the percent of their uh, budget that comes from franchise fees and other soft money sources to include rec fees. And all of them was greater than 50%. And so um, recognizing your concerns, the Park Service also has concerns that as, as your businesses do not do well, so too the Park Service does not have the revenue to come in to manage a lot of its operations to include the concession specialists, many of them that are out in the field and working with you are actually paid out of the franchise fees that you remit um, based on your gross revenue. So we want to be really conscientious about making sure that we're, um, we're uh, very cognizant of your business and the need to support you to, so that you can provide visitor services because that's, that's our primary interest. You provide a critical visitor service opportunity, but also that we make good business decisions on behalf of the park service and visitors. So knowing and trying to get a point at, to a point in time where we can estimate that a little bit better is where we need to be. And that's probably not going to be for a month or two, at least. At this point in time, we don't even know what the closures are going to look like and what the time frames for them are. So great question. And uh, if anybody knows out there what, the, what that should look like, um, you know, feel free to send that to us and we'll, uh, and we'll put that down on paper and say, well, these people absolutely know, you know, have some sort of crystal ball or they, or some magic wand that they know what's going on. Cause at this point in time, we really don't, um, we're, we're hanging on just like you guys are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're all figuring it out. That's for sure. Thanks yeah. for, thanks yeah. for that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we'll certainly be, working with you as things develop. I feel like you have to go, right, Kurt? It's I can bit. probably go another five minutes or so. Um, Great. Great. I'll just. But we'll max you out then. Uh, what else we got, Hillary? Uh, yeah, Pat asked, um, has there been discussion regarding a one-time relief for concessionaires? Concessionaires. I think we're, um, I think we're kind of revisiting the same topic, uh, which I completely understand. Uh, there is discussion about that. As we talked about, that was the franchise fee holiday that I described, which is an approach that was taken before. Uh, whether that's an approach that uh, would that the secretary would decide that he wanted to take uh, based on the statutory authority is a, is a question that we'll have to look at when we have a better understanding about what ulti the ultimate impact is and what the best way to manage that impact is for you all. I think the inverse of that question is, uh, um, you know, you know, how much space is there to, uh, you know, increase revenues once the, uh, uh, once operate, once folks are be able to begin operating again or operating at an increased capacity um, in terms of, say, allowing a, a few more people on a trip, or relaxing a group size concern, or as you mentioned, extending a season. Um, could we put that on the table? Yeah, so so I guess um, I, I would say that that's probably a, uh, a park by park decision. And a lot of that is based upon carrying capacities of the park. And even though we may not be seeing anybody going down a river or climbing a mountain now, um, uh, we don't want to be in a situation where we're tripling or, you know, quadrupling the number of people that's going down a river all at, all at the same point in time. So I can't really say to that. I think that that's really a natural resource management issue that's going to be managed at the park. And I will admittedly, I don't have the experience in terms of carrying capacity and group size 
in regards to that, that I can answer that really well. It's certainly a conversation to have with the park. Uh, and I think parks are, are going to look to try to be flexible within the context of their constraints, which are uh, resource management and, uh, and safe, health and safety. So that's certainly an option. I, I did talk earlier, and, I, um, and Hillary, I might have gotten uh, the question wrong, but we talked about extensions. So there's extensions of contracts. There's also the potential to extend seasons, right? So uh, I think that that's another piece where um, understanding the resource impacts and also, also understanding as we extend seasons what the impact to uh, the infrastructure needs for the park are. So, you know, extending a season is great, but if we have to meet, if that also means that we have to bring on rangers for that extra time or keep a wastewater treatment plant open for a period of time or whatever, um, those, are imp those are things that parks have a better understanding of and want to put into the mix of making that decision. I think those things should definitely be ideas that you should be putting forward to say, you know, here's a way, you're absolutely right, Aaron, that Maybe it's not just a relief on what we're paying back, but maybe the opportunity to get some more service provided. And uh, and I think that would certainly, again, if it fits within the context of park planning and, and its ability, would uh, would address the secretary's interest in providing recreation services. So, so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So we are uh, we definitely used that five minutes. So uh, for everyone whose question hasn't been asked yet, um, you can let us know if you want us to follow up on it. Or um, some of these questions are also kind of more about um, like relief package type of things that maybe is more for AO to address. Uh, but I will I will wrap up. That's the end of my question asking. Okay. okay. And Thanks. Yeah, folks, and I'm sure Kurt, you're open to this too. Uh, if, if folks want to shoot questions uh, Hillary's way or my way, and there's uh, something that, that we feel like we could uh, could or should uh, forward to you, Kurt, we will. If there's something that we as uh, your association staff uh, can either uh, answer or or it turns out to be something that we need to put on our, on our advocacy platform, uh, we'll go that way too. So, um, thanks. I, uh, I did not expect this hour to go this quickly, but look at that. Uh, here we yeah. are. So, and, and I and I want to um, volunteer, Aaron. I am happy to meet with you all again. I I appreciate the opportunities that I have a couple times a year to to actually see folks. Uh, I, unfortunately, in my position, they don't let me do a lot of uh, ride-alongs or uh, that sort of thing. So. You know, my ability to meet with you is usually at a conference or around the big board table. So uh, an opportunity to talk to you again uh, would be great as, you know, and it's really up to you. I, I am happy to make myself available for, you know, additional discussion. So, Well, thank you very much. And you've expressed that interest before to, uh, you know, uh, be in more regular contact with all of us. So, uh, yeah, thanks for continuing to hit that note. Um, and maybe as we're uh, is, is the guidance is shifting from, uh, you know, how to manage uh, uh, closing or constraining your operation is how to um, sort of retool and reopen. Uh, that might be a good opportunity to reconnect. That'd be great. So. Yep. Uh, and, you know, of course, it's dynamic. So it could be that two weeks from now, there's something that you're really interested in talking about that we didn't even know about today. Yep. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Hillary, for uh, uh, keeping another webinar running very smoothly. Thanks to all of you for tuning in. Uh, appreciate the continued participation and uh, thanks for uh, continuing to give us guidance and feedback on what your needs are, where your concerns are, so we continue to meet those and hopefully see a lot of you tomorrow uh, as we uh, talk about something. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And uh, I hope you're all doing okay out there. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the day. Take care.